imagine this. It's your last day on the job. You've been working as a cook at that small restaurant for over a year, which for cooks is pretty good. Considering high turnover rates and such in the industry, it's almost like, you know how you convert dog years into human years? <laughs> you multiply by seven. In the same way, one year for a cook in the same restaurant is almost like working five years in a traditional job. And also, given the fact that you gave proper notice instead of storming off in the middle of dinner rush and giving the chef the middle finger as you walk out, that's doubly impressive. That's like high five material. Anyways, as you've been prepping and getting ready for service, you've been sensing the other cooks being a little on edge throughout your shift. You've caught the other guys stealing knowing glances at one another. There's almost like an unspoken dialogue that's been circulating around you. It's, how can I describe it? You know, it's like how the dudes in heist movies <laughs> look at each other just before donning their masks and bursting out of the van and into the bank or the museum where the crown jewel is being displayed at the elite fundraiser that night where the mayor is going to be there. You know, it's all Gotham. <laughs> it's got the Gotham-esque feel. But you know what I'm saying? That kind of feel, that, that kind of, those kind of glances, you're sensing that. You have a feeling of what's to happen, but you don't know quite know how exactly it's going to go down. There's a relaxed tension in the air, if that makes any sense. Like a surprise party atmosphere, right? Like, yet yeah, more sinister. <laughs> you can't quite think about it much more as the printer is now like spitting up orders at a pace that you're struggling to keep up with. So your attention is now drawn to the preparing and the plating. You're sweating more than usual, yet you work desserts and the cold station, so you shouldn't be that hot, <laughs> right? But there's an anxiety that's causing you some friction and some heat from within. I mean, it's your last day, which is always a bittersweet deal, and you want to leave on a high note. You want to leave everything spotless. You, you want to be remembered as a team player. Like, be a professional, right? Now, as the crunch starts to slow down, there is a collective sigh of relief that all cooks breathe as they realize that they're no longer in the weeds. The printer is quieter now, and pushing out an order once in a while rather than in a stream that you could, you know, hang from <laughs> one corner of the room to another, like at an office birthday party or some kid's party. <laughs> this is when cooks usually take a moment to wipe down, replace any mise en place, and to take a breather. This is also the time smokers are chomping at the butt to get out there for their darts. And you just happen to be one of those smokers, so you're raring to go. You also know you need to get back soon because your dessert rush is going to start in about 10 minutes. So you're hoping you get there soon. Now, luckily, one of the non-smoking cooks, I used to be one, <laughs> one of the rare ones, decides to watch the line for the entire crew so that everyone can have their quick puff. He releases you all to get your fixes. You're a happy camper because you have been jonesing for a while now. You've really been looking forward to this smoke. So everyone jumps off their stations and hauls, aft, hauls ass off the line to the rear exit of the kitchen. You stay behind for a moment or two. You're finishing out a, a quick order. And then you yourself kind of walk run to the back as well towards the alleyway slash smoke room. And as you turn the corner before hitting the alleyway, it happens. The crew is all there, eyes on the prize, and that prize is you. And before you know it, <laughs> the sous chef, who is who easily has a hundred pounds on you, grabs you by like he grabs you like Andre the Giant on a roasted Cornish game hen, right? And then tosses you into the elevator used to bring food orders from the back of the restaurant to the basement for storage. The smoke that you had in your hand, ready to light, falls to the side, just flops away. The chef immediately shuts the gate and presses the button to lower you to your fate. Kind of like that poor soul in Indiana Jones, <laughs> the Temple of Doom. The chef stops the elevator halfway down. You're trapped! My poor little sacrificial lamb. You can see everyone staring at you through the wooden slats of the gate above you. You're wondering... 
if you have to put the lotion on and so you don't get the hose again, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but there you are. You see in the hands of the sous chef, a 20 liter pail. This can be no good. <laughs> and you can smell whatever it is that's in there from where you stand. And before you can turn your head, the contents of the pail showers you like a massive water balloon. It's cold, slimy, wet, and reeks to high hell. And before you can even think about retching, <laughs> you get hit with something that feels like a glitter bomb. It's white and it's sandy. It's flour. And you stand there for a moment, wipe your eyes, and look up to see the staff howling with laughter. You feel like a breaded fish stick and a rotted fish stick <laughs> by the smell of it because whatever was in that liquid is abominable in aroma you curse everyone out and you find yourself laughing through the f-bombs you also laugh because you know everyone's gonna have to clean it up that's just part of the ritual like you have been on the other side of the elevator gate and you know whoever dealt it mops it you know the deal now you start to feel the elevator slowly move up and the chef and sous chef await you as the gate finally lifts and opens. They laugh, but in a brotherly way. They have a clean jacket waiting for you and a towel. The guy who works the veg station takes you to the dish but to help rinse off all the breading <laughs> off of you. And as you clean yourself off, you breathe a sigh of relief knowing that it's over, it's done. You think of how good that, fear, that first beer is going to be with the lads as you share stories about your time at that restaurant, about how you'll stay in touch and what's to come. A smile creases your face, and now in your clean, dry jacket, you go off to get that very well-deserved smoke and then shut down for the night. Okay, before y'all start screaming for HR and all that jazz, <laughs> let's give this a bit of context. One, this was common back in the day, and I saw it in almost every restaurant I worked at or you know, I knew friends that worked at. Now, having said that, I have recently seen some TikToks where cooks are still doing this kind of thing to this day, so I can only assume that this is still a thing. And from what I gather, it's still mostly in fine dining restaurants. Like, I... Don't recall or don't think you see this kind of silliness at a TGIFs or Eastside Mario's or any of those kind of middle of the road restaurants. I think it was something more reserved for those who worked in small, bougier places. Now, I could be wrong, though, so maybe someone can correct me. So if you were working in those kind of little bougie, small, fine dining restaurants, you knew <laughs> the day would come where it was your turn. Second. Not every single person got it. Collectively, the crew would read the room and know if that person would be receptive to that foolishness. There were some people we knew that it just wouldn't be well received if they got the royal treatment, so we, as we can say. So we would just maybe get them a card or something else. We still wanted them to feel included and missed, etc. It just, it just depend on the chef as well. Because if she or he were not into the splashy, messy stuff, then the crew would follow suit and again, do something different to send the cook off. Like in one place, I got like a set of books and it was all signed or I got cards. It just depends. Not every place was like that. Third, the point of dousing someone on their last day wasn't to humiliate or bully them, but to just have some fun with them. You know, we had to know that the person was someone who could laugh with us and not just us at them. That was so critical. And it also depended on who they were. The cook in the story was someone who really loved <laughs> to razz others, who took delight in pranking us, but was also a cool dude who could take a joke as well. So when it came to him, oh, he got the smoke. He got the special sauce. See, normally people would get a bucket of water thrown on them or something, or you know, maybe everyone would pick up the person and put them in a large dishwashing sink and spray them with water, already have it filled with ice water or something. And that's usually about it. Maybe a whipped, cr uh, a whipped cream pie in the face. Nothing too crazy. But <laughs> for our friend, he got the razzle-dazzle. He got the jazz hands. And let me tell you something. That vile bucket of goo I talked about, yours truly took care of that. You see, I was there, clearly. And I worked with that cat. And man, we, <laughs> we had a blast. So I was asked to prepare that bucket a week before we did it, before we did the breading on that bad boy. So what was in that bucket, Paul? Well, 
a little share. I'll share a little recipe. And this is one of the few times I share a recipe. In that bucket was sour milk, pickle juice, calamari liquid, old yeast, yogurt, fish sauce, flat old beer that the bartenders would give us, dish pit water, and I think I emptied an ashtray in there at some point. <laughs> it's kind of like special seasoning, right? And there were a few other things too, but you get the idea. It was gross. And I kept that bucket hidden and covered outside in the summer heat. So it a little, had a little extra fermented zing. Nice. And it was gross. It was, a, it was vile. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself, by the way. And after our buddy got out of the elevator and off to clean up, I remember that the chef and sous chef sweeping and mopping and saying that as nasty as it was, it was worth it. Now, you know, I, I recount this. This was at least 20 years ago, but I can still see it as clear as a bell in my mind's eye. And what's funny is that months later, when it was my turn to leave, they tried to douse me with the water. And I quickly blocked it. I was sitting on a, a folded chair and I happened to be, uh, I happened to catch it out of the corner of my eye and I lifted up my chair and it splashed back on them. Um, it was fun. I mean, we were in the back drinking beer, but I knew something was coming. I sensed that we all do. Uh, but that was fun too, you know, because I sensed, I knew that they felt comfortable with me and I with them. Now, in the end, it's about having a laugh with someone and not at them, like I've said. And this also brings me to the point or lesson or insight of the story. And that's the power and importance of trust in relationships, whether it's with coworkers, friends, community, or even yourself. Trust. It can be a deal sealer or a deal breaker. So I'm going to share some ways that you can build more trust in the workplace specifically and what to do when there's been a betrayal or lack of trust to begin with. So stick around. I once had the executive chef of a large operation I worked in pull me into his office and tell me in no uncertain terms, clear as day, that the rest of the team didn't trust me. At the time, I was in the throes of my alcohol, alcoholism and definitely was unreliable. I, I don't want to blame the booze. I created that situation in the first place. It just, it just was. And the chef was absolutely right. I wasn't to be counted on, and I was a hot mess. And of all the things to be laid at my feet before me, being told others didn't trust me was a stinger. Like, it just... It just pierced my heart. It was really hard to hear. In fact, it really sucked. And I can still hear it in, in, in my ears today. To this day, sometimes it pops up. Now, I share that because trust is one of the most critical elements of a healthy relationship, whether it's families, teams, organizations, or communities, or clubs. And to be told that that bond has been shattered, it feels like you've been punched in the gut with a sack of Yukon Golds. You feel anxiety and fear and resentment and worry and doubt and wonder if you can ever make amends. And it's just as bad, if not worse, for the person or people who feel betrayed, of course. When someone tells you that they don't trust you, you can get defensive or worth withdrawn or even go on the attack. But in the end, you have to understand, this is not a cool situation for anyone. Trust is the belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. It's a feeling of psychological safety that someone will do what they promise and that they're worth your time and attention. It's committing to their integrity. It's believing that they will show up for you, even if you don't know exactly what that looks like. Like how you trust your partner and feel no need to go through their phone or handbag or something. You just There's this implicit trust that you have with them. Now, for our tempura cook <laughs> in the story, while he was uncertain what his fate was in the elevator, he trusted us, knowing that there would be no harm, that we wouldn't humiliate him or make him feel deeply uncomfortable. While he didn't necessarily enjoy the nasty liquid soaking into his back like custard into bread for French toast, he knew that we always had, had his back. In working, we all had that camaraderie and trusting relationship as a brigade where we'd, we'd help each other when someone was sinking. And that's the thing with trust. It's something that builds over time with each interaction. The more you can demonstrate that you'll be there, that you'll do as you say, and that you're, you're reliable, the more trust you build, right? 
it's built in small moments as we show up for each other and, and listen when others are upset and we prioritize our important relationships over other things and people. In Jack Donovan's book, The Way of Men, which is a great book, by the way, he talks a lot about how the character of a man was measured in how much the other men around him could trust him, about how he could fight or defend. You know, back when tribal warfare was, was a thing, you needed to trust that the man behind you or the men on either side of you would watch out for you and protect you and you them. If not, you were relegated to the middle of the tribe with the women and the children and the elderly. This was like true life and death stuff. So it was taken very seriously. And while, of course, this isn't just for men, uh, you know, there's obviously amazing sisterhood bonds and mixed bonds. This story involves only men. So, you know, this type of connection was very masculine and very primal in some ways. We had this implicit trust that, you know, that Donovan writes about. There was no doubt that no matter what happened, we were a unit. A team. We didn't even have to like each other per se, but we respected one another. And seeing, you know, each other go to war, so to speak, with our knives out <laughs> and our battered bodies full of scars and burns and making it through yet another service, this was something that brought us closer. Uh, kind of like a fraternity of French knives and French fries, <laughs> if you will. French lamb racks, I don't know. Now, all of that might seem a wee bit dramatic, but in many ways it's true. It's how we bond with others. We share a common struggle. This could be like your IT team, your pickleball squad, your family, your community center, volunteer brigade, whatever. When you have a common goal and you see each other striving towards it while helping each other out, you have that golden trust that binds you together. When it comes to the workplace, Trust helps to build stronger communication, to help everyone work faster and more efficiently. It, it increases morale and better decision making. It, it creates more innovation and collaboration and creativity, and it can make work a hell of a lot more fun and a lot easier. I mean, there's nothing more stressful than someone on your team who is regularly unreliable when they don't follow through with the promises um, that they make or when they don't show up when and where they said they will be. And so when that happens, you start not to rely on them. And if you can't rely on someone to help you out when you need it or to be present with you or to do what they say they're going to do, then that's when you start to feel trust eroding. And you know when trust is shattered. It's very hard to rebuild. Sometimes it's an impossible task. Rebuilding trust can be done, of course, but it's an uphill battle. A team that is threaded through with mistrust is a fractured team. If you go into battle not trusting everyone on your team, you, you're already on your heels before the first sword strike or the first <laughs> swordfish order. <laughs> Sorry. But here's one thing about mistrust. Sometimes it's not about you. Sometimes there isn't anything you can say or do that can sway anyone. Some folks enter a relationship, workplace, or club struggling with trauma, damaged boundaries, or bullying, or low self-esteem, or mental health disorders, or any other reasons why trust is challenging for them. And those have nothing to do with you. Nothing. And before we jump into how to deepen trust or how to repair trust that was never bestowed upon or which had been damaged, know this. In the case of my old coworker, if there had been no trust or we sensed that something wasn't quite cricket about things, we wouldn't have done the breaded veal cutlet on him. We would have left him alone. We, like I said, we may have gotten him a card or something else, but we wouldn't have done anything like that that would traumatize or traumatize them further. Again, you got to read the room. And when trust isn't there, when that camaraderie is fractured, then you need to adjust. So with that, let's look into ways of adjusting and or amplifying trust. When I was told that no one trusted me at work, that place, I was gutted. Then I was angry. 
Like, how could they not trust me? I, I, I was a good guy, wasn't I? But the reality is I wasn't a good guy. I was selfish. I was spraying my emotions everywhere, bringing the team down. I was inconsistent, deceitful, selfish, and self-serving. Good man, right? When I realized that, yes, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. <laughs> I was angry with myself. This wasn't what I wanted. You know, I prided myself on my trustworthiness. And having betrayed so many people, oof, that was like a boning knife to the heart. So what do you do when someone feels that you're mistrustful? Again, this may have nothing to do with you. Or perhaps without knowing, you may have done or said something that put your trust in the friend zone, so to speak. So here are seven <laughs> reasons your trust may be as worthless as a cordless jump rope or a DVD rewinder. One, you don't follow through with promises, agreements, or commitments. Two, you judge and blame others instead of offering useful criticism. Three, you betray confidence through things like gossiping and backstabbing. Four, you're self-serving and serve others only when it benefits you. Five, you hide or distort the truth from others. Six, you downplay or dismiss others people, other people's contributions. And seven, there's a huge gap between what you say and what you do. Now, I worked for a boss once, you know, when it was our days off, when we the cooks had our days off, he would fill in on our stations. We would do our best to make sure the station was more than adequately stocked for him so that he didn't have to worry about it so that he could do his other kind of sous chefly duties like ordering and things like that. But he would purposely and with glee run your prep down to nothing. He made it a game out of making sure that when you got back, there was literally nothing waiting for you. And we know that because he would laugh and tell others while you were off. So it was, it was clear. He also got, you know, tips and bottles of wine from the beverage manager and all that kind of stuff. And he never shared it with any of us, even drinking the wine while we were working and cleaning up. He purposely liked to trip us up, play us off of each other. He gossiped and tried to act tough and belittle everyone whenever he could. Now, do you think he was trustworthy? Do you think we felt he had our back? I will say more on an episode more about this cat because there's more lessons with him, <laughs> which is great. He was a gift. Um, but suffice to say, we kept our guard up when he was around. And we didn't perform as well for him because we had no reason to do so. We did what we had to do, but we didn't go above and beyond because of him. So what could he have done to regain our trust? What could I have done to regain, to, to regain my colleagues' trust in that one place? Well, here are a few things that you can do to rebuild trust. One, own it. Speak it. Don't hide. Talk about what happened and let others know that you're willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Second, ask what you can do to make amends, to make things right. And also ask if there's anything else that you need to know. You might assume certain things, but they may have some more information for you, which is going to be very helpful in making those amends. Three, <laughs> shut up and listen. That's it. <laughs> this is where you don't talk. You'll listen to your people's thoughts and feelings. Resist the urge to defend, to counterclaim, to mollify, or to console. Just be present. Make notes if needed, but actively listen. People will have their reactions, so let them have them with no judgment or anger on your end. Four, repeat back what you heard. Don't smooth over or minimize. Use the words they used. Acknowledge the damage you did. Be sincere and apologize for the impact you made on them. Take responsibility for your part. That's your job. Five, take action. Use the suggestions that your team or whomever you're speaking to as a, as a way to make amends. And take action immediately. Don't sit on it. The sooner you can step into doing something to rebuild trust, the better. 
prioritize it, move things around so you can get onto that like soon. When people see you doing this, this will go a long way in recapturing some of that trust. Six, over communicate, at first at least. Letting people know what you're doing, when it's gonna be done and such is important. You can ease off later, but for now, you're in the spotlight champ and everyone's watching. So again, don't get defensive or pouty. If you are, then go back to step one. <laughs> Build that transparency and integrity. Let everyone know what's going on as often as you can. And like I said, after that, you can rein it in and get back to kind of a more quote unquote normal way of doing things. You know, taking these steps can make a huge difference in repairing trust with your group, whether it's a work thing or with friends or with a community club, whatever it is. Now with romantic relationships, it's a bit trickier because there's way more moving parts, which is why I didn't really get into that in this episode, but you can certainly use these same principles in relationships. And Hey, if for some reason trust can't be rebuilt, it just may be time to accept that and move on. You know, I didn't get a chance to rebuild trust at that place I was talking about. You know, it wasn't until I got sober and started working on myself, I was able to start trusting myself a lot more, which helped me hold trustworthiness with others. I did make amends with some of those people later on, but at the time I wasn't able to do it. I wasn't in a position. You know, trust now is a huge value to me. And as a coach, it's one of the pillars of what I do and how I create a safe space for others. So this was a huge lesson for me as well. Now, if you already have trust in your group and you want to have more velocity in your posse, then here are five ways you can continue to build and amplify that trust. I'm full of numbers and lists today. That's, that's what it is today, guys. <laughs> Okay, one, be open and honest. Doesn't mean spilling the beans on yourself or having heavily emotional cry fest. It means being transparent and letting people know when they're coming up short with duties, but also letting them know when they're exceeding. Sometimes, you know, I talk about catching people doing things right rather than wrong. And it's also about owning up to any errors you make and making amends to them, like I described earlier. Two, listen before speaking, actively listening taking in feedback or criticism kindly. Consider other people's ideas before making your decisions or adding your two cents. Don't talk over them. Let them know that you're open and available for input. Three, give what you want to get. Show respect if you want respect. Show humility if you want humility. Show trustworthiness if you want trustworthiness. In other words, lead by example and set the tone. If you're a gossip hound, after a while, everyone around you is going to follow suit and guess what they'll be talking or who they'll be talking about. Mm. If you're all about integrity, well, then that will rub off on your team or colleagues as well. Four, be an in integrity. That is, do what you say you're going to do. Be your word. Don't litter the workplace with empty promises like, you know, empty candy bar wrappers. Make your words count so others can count on you. And five, value disagreement. A strong team will not always agree on things, but it's working through the disagreements that actually builds more trust. When people speak up, it's, it's often because they feel safe to do so, even if it's not in favor of something you've said or done. So that's, that's a good thing in many ways. So working things out with respect and humility and integrity goes a long way compared to repressing it and have it, have it show up in some passive aggressive behavior or through sabotaging or just outright aggression. Like I said earlier, I didn't always like the people I worked with, but I trusted that they would do the right thing for the team and to help us all out as I would do for them. Some people I would hang out for, you know, I'd hang out after work with drinks and sometimes I, there'd be people I wouldn't talk to until I saw them next shift. I mean, that's humanity. That's relationships. Trust is a glue that holds relationships, families, groups, communities, countries, and even the world together. Without trust, there's threat of war, panic, pain, suffering, and fractured relations. And that comes from within, right? As the Dalai Lama once said, to earn trust, money and power aren't enough. You have to show some concern for others. You can't buy trust in the supermarket. Trust is fluid and dynamic. 
you go with the flow or you can suffer a breakdown where everyone suffers. My man in that elevator trusted because he felt safe. He knew that we'd help him clean up. He knew that we did it because we cared and trusted him and we were, we were going to miss him. And if I remember correctly, he got it the worst because he was such a kind, loving, helpful young guy, but also gruff and grumpy and short with people. He was the complete picture and wore his heart on his sleeve, even if his sleeve was covered in rotten milk and calamari juice at the time. But he was wonderful. You know, those are some good times back then. And that camaraderie and those lessons still sit with me now. And this is why I want to share these with you. So thank you. Well, speaking of trust, I trust that this episode was useful or entertaining or maybe both to you. So if you so please uh, do me a favor by liking, commenting, subscribing, or hitting the bell for notifications. Any interactions you have with this video helps the algorithm open it up to more people. And one of my goals is to have this grow beyond my imagination. Also, don't forget to check out my coaching offers on my site. Link is in the notes. I help people release their creative and powerful person that they are within. I work with leaders of all kinds, including hospitality teams and leaders. I also do men's work, work with busy entrepreneurs to express their creativity and life coaching in general. So. I thank you ahead of time for your support. All right, it's time to sweep up, prep up, and close up. Kitchen's closed. Now scram. Bye.